I see entry in the audience. I'm I'm entry and I'm working on on Tails, which is a Debian derivative. I'm Mika and I'm working on Grimo, which is another Debian derivative. We pronounce it Grimo. It's G R M L. <laughs> so, questions of? <laughs> uh, John Vert, work on SteamOS. Jeffrey Thomas, I uh, used to work mostly on Debathena, which was an MIT uh, lightweight derivative of Ubuntu. Colin Watson, uh, wearing my Ubuntu hat, this R. I suppose um, I used to do embedded Debian stuff, but we just kind of closed it, so uh, it doesn't really count anymore. <laughs> uh, Adam Conrad, also Ubuntu. On this? Right now. Uh. Oh, you want me to talk a little louder? Uh, Adam Conrad, Ubuntu for the next 50 minutes. <laughs> do we have any of the HP guys here? Up the back? Bill Brothers with H Linux out of HP. Okay, that's everybody. Um, anybody who's a Debian contributor interested in getting involved in derivative stuff? <laughs> Looks like no. Okay, um, anything any people want to bring up? General discussion. Here we go. Paul. Uh, I uh, I noticed I was looking at the apt bugs with a new mentee of mine, and we noticed that the format for repositories is not uh, fully documented. And basically, I understand that that's something you're also working on in terms of derivatives. Uh, we emailed the bug for apt to say so that we were interested in. Uh, finalizing the docs there, but I thought I would ask what the status is and if re repo generation is something that's hard for derivatives or if they just deal fine. As far as I know, uh, well, in the derivative census, there's a field about what um, repository format, gener I mean, what repository generation tool. Most of them use rep rep repro or FTP, uh, apt FTP scan thingy. And the format was documented like a year ago on that wiki page, I think is the name of it, I'm guessing. Um, yeah. Um, <coughs> do you also want to take, um, have blends under this to to topic? Debian blends? Debian blends, yeah, we can hear from a blends perspective because they're two sides of the same kind of coin, adapting Debian for a specific use. And the difference is only whether that's integrated into Debian or not. Well, to, to, to some extent. Can you elaborate for those who are new? Pardon? Can you elaborate for those who are new? Okay. So a blend, well, there's, there's a Debian pure blend and there's a Debian blend. The difference is that uh, Debian pure blend is already all inside Debian completely. The Debian blend is aiming to be Debian pure blend. Um, yeah. So did you want to... Um, I think there are plans for Jesse to have the options to install some blends by default or with a default Debian installer. I think this is good news. The blinds people are really looking forward to that as well. So I was wondering if um, derivatives have any plans for secure boot except for you know Ubuntu, and if there was like some shared work for that. Uh, this is kind of a backwards. Hang on, let me put this down. 
Uh, this is kind of a backwards answer, but I would suspect that it, it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of people were waiting for us to actually get it sorted out in Debian, uh, which we are working on. Um, I haven't heard much, well, I've heard a couple of people asking about, uh, there were a couple of people in the UFE secure boot or possibly the grub buff uh, asking about, uh, you know, how they would, how they would arrange to apply their signatures. Uh, on top of uh, oh, Debian's. Uh, there were a couple of people uh, at the UFE Secure Boot buff, I think, asking how they could uh, apply their own signatures to top of Debian. So I know some people are interested, uh, the, um, but I would expect most people to be waiting for Debian at this point. Uh, if anybody wants to contradict me, please do. So. As a follow-up to that, I wonder which derivatives actually ship their own kernel and therefore have a need for um, actually signing their own stuff. The Raise your hand. And which of them don't really want to go through the Microsoft signing process and, you know. Well, hang on, let's split on a bit. Um, so, the regarding the Microsoft signing process, regarding the Microsoft signing process, uh, the direction that this is going, I'm told by Shim folks, is that uh, uh, they're working on making their builds reproducible so that the difference between uh, the same version of Shim with a different embedded key will just be a different ELF section at the end. Uh, and they're working with Microsoft on that to make sure that Microsoft will be able to fast track such applications so that you won't have to wait months for an answer, well, weeks or months for an answer. Uh, so that Microsoft will just be able to see, oh yeah, this is the same binary with a different key. Here, have a signature. Um, doesn't save you from having to pay, pay the sort of relatively nominal cost to Microsoft. Um, I gather if, uh, in, in case anybody has ethical qualms, uh, I have heard that it's a cost center for Microsoft, as in we pay them less than they spend doing the work, so you can consider that. <laughs> I'll make a brief comment here uh, because I want to possibly solicit people to work on this. Uh, so with my uh, school alum hat, we're using the Ubuntu kernel, which doesn't care strongly about like signed kernel modules at the moment. Uh, if it does start to do that, we may have to think how, uh, how to do that because we care about OpenAFS, which is an out of tree kernel module. Uh, and there may be some, we may have to think as we're using DKMS, so we may have to do something to be able to load that if uh, Ubuntu ever changes plans there. Uh, Ubuntu, we have DKMS as well. Can people yeah. stand up and use the microphone? Sure. Uh, so uh, at the moment where we are able to use Ubuntu DKMS compiled modules because Ubuntu doesn't do signature checking, uh, with my uh, day job hat on, we are including proprietary out of tree modules into the product we ship, but we are shipping a whole image product uh, where we aren't, you know, saying that you get to do arbitrary things in user space and you get to customize user space. Uh, here is an image and the whole image boots and we're actually totally fine verifying the whole image because that's the security model we have ourselves. I am interested in working with people who are following the same model uh, because that may, for people using live systems and so forth, uh, that may make things easier than pulling in all of the secure boot patch set to enforce the strict uh, user space and kernel space boundary. Uh, so the root versus kernel space boundary. So that is an option and I would be happy to talk to folks offline uh, if you want to collaborate on making this easier. It's fine. I have a conversation maybe to get the, a question to maybe get more conversation happening, which is, uh, how is it being a Debian derivative? What could Debian change? Uh, what pain points are there? 
Or is it always just great? <laughs> so H Linux um, is primarily being built for use to uh, being the foundation of OpenStack solution set delivered by uh, HP called Helion. You guys probably have heard of that. Um, it is a closed model. It is an image-based model in OpenStack, but um, there is a number of other initiatives in the company that have gotten very excited about the fact that we have uh, open source operating system in HP that we can do things with, and we're seeing a lot of demand for uh, custom pieces or, or configurations. You'd be happy to know that we've made a concerted effort that anything that we put in H Linux will come back into open source, period. There will not be ever any proprietary stuff put into that to know that solution that doesn't come back into open source space. So uh, having said that, there's some real tricky pieces that are being worked on and and it's been difficult. Some of you attended the session by Rocky Craig where he talked about how we're, we're building an ocean of every repository piece and you can pull an arbitrary repository out of, out of that ocean at any given point in time. And so uh, versioning has become a really interesting thing as well as following all the rebranding rules as associated with that and being able to uniquely identify all the right pieces that belong to the right right parts. So I think probably the biggest issues that we've had is to try to follow the rebranding rules and not break uh, Deb Installer or Deb Bootstrap, right, and all use all the right tools to, to get the pieces to fall in place. So it would be great if you could uh, help update the branding stuff for problems that you found and like we'd like to fix those issues. So unfortunately, Rocky and, and another fellow in, there, in the team, and Josh Hawkins, have really done all that work. Uh -huh. uh, I, don't have enough, I don't have depth to, enough depth to describe it here, but we right. can certainly you we know, can do that over that. email, bug reports. Yeah, sort we of could thing. definitely do that to describe the problem. So, if you would uh, bring up a thread on the Debbie derivatives mailing list, that'd be great. So one problem we are facing is um, changing configuration files, like diverting <coughs> configuration files um, without going crazy in post install scripts. Um, so um, for example, um, we had this discussion about um, the SSH init script. We, we have different needs and so we can ship the upstream one. We had this discussion. Um, which I fully agree with, that our um, modification can't be shipped uh, upstream, but we still need to divert the init script accordingly. Are you familiar with config package dev? Uh, have you looked into config package dev as a system for doing these sorts of diversions? Uh, okay, uh, I'll briefly advertise it. Uh, Config Package Dev is a tool that's in the Debian archive. It's not intended to be used for packages. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for backporting it, by the way. Um, no worries. I uh, it. Uh, it's a tool that's intended to be used. Uh, it's a dev helper tool, also a CDBS tool. Uh, it's not intended to be used in packages in the archive because it will make them stupidly policy non-compliant, but that's not what it's for. Uh, it lets you say in a fairly straightforward way in nice dev helper style syntax, I would like to replace uh, this particular packaged file with my own copy by doing dpackage diversions and undiversions uh, in the post instant pre RM as appropriate. Uh, it handles all of the cases. Uh, it also has a thing called uh, transformations where you can say, I'd like to install, build depend upon this package take the current version of the configuration file as I see it during the package build, apply this set script or Perl script to it, and then package the result of that as file.conf.myderivative. And then when you, uh, when you build the package, when you install the package, it will automatically create a diversion. Uh, it also has, uh, for various technical reasons involving dpackage and diversions in edge cases, and uh, it will 
uh, not directly drop your file in place, it will make a symlink, uh, and it is supported for the end user to decide to point that symlink back at the original version of the package. Uh, we do keep the original version around, so you can use it for wrapper scripts and user bin, et cetera. Uh, that is the other thing. Uh, if your upstreams can be talked into using .d directories, uh, that also solves the problem, but config package dev is great for wrapper scripts. Any other thoughts? Okay. So dpackage vendor is very useful for doing slight variations between things, but at what point does it become craziness when we try how much can we merge into the packaging? How many dis so, you know, uh, derivatives? Before, so, so uh, in general, it's often used to have the Debian and Ubuntu versions, and we ignore everything else. But if we were to put like 60 um, derivatives, flavors of config files in, that might be a bit crazy. And I just wonder what we think we should be doing with that. I suspect that uh, that a lot of distributions will actually want kind of similar-ish things. So we'll end up not having 60, but more like. A couple, a few variants. Uh, so I merge the the only package I'm aware of with with more than one use of Deepak Gender is Grub2, uh, which uh, for which I got code for something called Teng uh, a derivative called Tenglu recently, uh, and uh, that's that's merged in as well. So, um, but that turned out to be essentially identical to uh, at least a subset of the Ubuntu patch set. So it really didn't add very much code at all. Can you explain how it works? Uh, Ashish asks, can I explain how it works, uh, Deepakuch Vendor in general? Um, Deepakuch Vendor, okay, so any distribution, any derivative may declare its relationship to its parent uh, in a set of conf files uh, that are read by bits of Deepakuch. Uh, so in Ubuntu, we have our distribution name is Vendor, or sorry, is Ubuntu, bits of similar metadata, our parent is Debian. Uh, you can say dpkuch vendor dash dash is Ubuntu, returns true. dpkuch vendor dash dash is Debian, returns false. dpkuch vendor dash dash derives from Debian, returns true, uh, etc. So uh, that's in that's in dpkuch dev. Uh, you can use it in development type context. So you can use it in rules files. You shouldn't use it at runtime. Uh, if you need that, then you build, then you either use LSB release or you build stuff dynamically to do the right thing, preferably the latter. Uh, dpkuch vendor, uh, then you can use it as a uh, you can use it in shell conditionals in uh, uh, in your Debian rules file and compile stuff conditionally. Uh, there is also some support for uh, for distribution specific patch series, uh, so you can say Debian slash patches slash series dot Ubuntu. Um, personally, I've never been. I don't know what other people's experiences with that uh, with that are. Uh, I've never been very keen on it because it. Uh, it complicates management of your uh, of your patch series in version control systems, uh, and also you have to duplicate because it supports removing patches. You have to duplicate the entire uh, contents of the series file in series.ubuntu or series.derivative, so it's really easy for it to get out of sync. Um, uh, so yeah, I don't like it very much for that reason. I prefer to write patches that implement conditional behavior, but apparently not everybody does. I'm just wondering, um, is there any Debian derivative not using initMFS tools, so like Draycard or something else? I, I think uh, Tangler might be looking at Record, I mean, yeah, but, um, also, <laughs> I'm with my <laughs> in drum fest tools head on, I, I'm looking at record and I think we already discussed on IRC regarding how we we could handle that. I mean, the main blocker to have, what I would like to see is that um, we don't have our own um, in drum implementation, but have something like distribution 
independent, um, like Red Hat, whatever. Um, and um, the main showstopper might be the live boot stuff and Draycut not being as flexible as we might need it. And um, just as a follow up, is any one of the DMN derivatives carrying any patches against init RAMFS tools or custom patches against um, live boot stuff, which isn't upstream yet? I'd like to hear. Yeah, so we, we, we really like in drum first tools, I think I'm <coughs> reasonably safe to say. Uh, and I think it came from Ubuntu originally. Um, the, uh, it kind of seems to me that moving to Drakert is a big bunch of effort with not a lot of upside. Um, we, yeah, we would get to share some, some patches, maybe some hooks, but it's, it, I suspect there's a lot of work to get there, and it's not it's not clear again from it. Um, the uh, as as far as live boot goes, we're still using Casper, and one of these days, I really must switch things over to live boot. But we've again big bunch of effort with not a lot of immediate upside. So. Fuck. Um, I'm having internet issues, but you can check the. Patches against the RamFS tools at this URL. I, um, this is based on the David Snapshot service. It downloads all the source packages from all the derivatives in the census and compares them to historical Debian source packages and dumps a patch for each uh, one that looks different where it can find something. So, I mean, it's not quite uh, a derivative not using it, but certainly during the ARM64 stuff <coughs> for uh, like a year, we didn't have KLibC, which means we didn't have init ramps. So, uh, you know, I find myself not using init ramps on real things quite a lot, uh, just because it's broken. Uh, so uh, the degree to which things can still work without that is, is, uh, is worth bearing in mind. Uh, and in fact, things seem to work r moderately well. We you lose a few things, but it's not nothing too critical. Uh, <laughs> just just old-fashioned booting, just just knowing it would just boot and uh, you know uh, and fix up anything that's broken. Yeah, I mean that's that's fine as long as you don't have anything very complicated. One thing that needs to happen in, to, in uh, with the derivative stuff is integrating these patches and information about those into the patch tracker. I mean the um, the package tracker. We need people who know Django, Python, um, and the census itself probably needs a little bit of work as well. That's all Python. Um, if there are any volunteers or people interested. That'd be great. Doesn't look like it right now. Maybe you're not ready to admit on camera. <laughs> um. I've got a question uh, for the room. Uh, speaking of I guess, tangenting off under RamFS, what are people using as installers? Are you using Debian installer? Are you using Ubiquity? Are you using something custom? What, what's popular? Well, <laughs> what, is, what is popular in terms of being used by derivatives? Uh, we're using, we have a Debian installer kind of uh, heavily preceded and customized, and so it's kind of a one-click install. And um, then we also have an image-based install. We basically take a Clonezilla snapshot of that uh, installed system with Steam and everything on it, uh, which is, I think, much more, for what we're doing, much more effective. Debian installer is way more complicated than we want to inflict on our users, basically. Um, at my workplace, we use DI preceded. Um, yeah. One of the issues that I've found for Jesse is that uh, you always get a grub prompt. Where do you want to install grub, even if you've only got one disk? Um, it's kind of annoying for Jesse. But um, I'm hoping we can fix that. It's problematic because we do both installs on physical servers and 
virtual machines and therefore the device name is different between the two. Um, VDA versus SDA because we're using VertIO. Yeah, so we use we use Dev Installer. Um, one of the things that we're doing because we're we're feeding the OpenStack bunch, they use uh, a, a tool called uh, Disk Image Builder. So they end up with an image that they that they raw boot the image rather than than using the installer. So really, the installer for us represents the way that the developer on the OpenStack side can can prepare their stuff and and for the disk image building process. So one of the problems with image-based uh, installation is that you get stuff on, this, on the image that's um, specific to a specific system like SSH host keys. How do you guys deal with that in SteamOS and HLinux? We are on the size of the Okay. There are other files like machine IDs and stuff like that. So SteamOS SSH isn't installed by default, so we don't have SSH keys, and we set the machine ID. We have some scripts that run after the imaging process, so we can set a unique ID for the machine at that point. Uh, I don't know of anything else that we need to clean up that's per machine there. So uh, Debian Live Project does some of that sort of stuff as well. I wonder if we could merge all the things, because there's like cloud in it thing, Debian Live thing, and probably more things, ubiquity. Yeah. It, it, it sounds like that's something we want to tag basically in, in packages. Uh, I mean, for, what? we do, like in, in systemd for instance, there's the machine ID file, yeah. and if there was a way for us to just tag it as this is the file you want to remove if you're building a image, like what? this is unique to your installation. What about not generating those files in the first place? How can we achieve that? Huh. Like a debconf variable, or uh, how how would you go about doing that? Basically, yeah, uh, that's my question. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. So in in our process, what happens is the. Uh, cloud development team ends up building an image with just exactly the packages they want and just exactly the configurations they want. That's built into a hard image that the customer can't crack open. They have no access to the OS in any form or fashion. There's no way for the customer to reach in and touch it. So there are, there are actually no tools that allow them to do that that end up on the final machine. So part of the reason that we have a really flexible a process for people to pull an exact set of packages and an exact set of images and an exact set of configurations is so that they can build that kind of image and they call that an appliance. So uh, the embedded people using embedded Debian often wanted to cross install so tend not to use DI and usually use multi-strap mostly because the bootstrap can only use one archive and we usually found ourselves using mostly the Debian stuff or the MDebian stuff plus some other bits, possibly some proprietary bits, whatever and it was much easier if they were in a separate repo and the uh, bootstrap's crap for that which is really irritating because um, otherwise it's great. Uh, so multi-strap, because it uses apt rather than some shell uh, can do arbitrarily complicated things but because of the way deep package works it can't run the pre-int scripts which is really annoying. Um, and mostly that doesn't break, uh, but some things do. Uh, like MySQL creates its users in the preint script, which is fucking irritating. What? Um, it used to anyway. So you didn't get in MySQL users, that didn't work. Unless you, so you end up, basically the, the mechanism is that there's a script, you need a script for the any fix-ups because you didn't have preints, and another script for effectively first boot stuff because of SSH keys and, and mm. Thingies and yeah, so a proper mechanism for first boot would improve our lives greatly. Um, and what do we think that should be? Dealing with the the multiple repository problem, either by making the bootstrap cleverer, which is hard in shell, or um, <laughs> fixing the problem with the preints missing, which is really hard. Um, either of these would be a massive improvement. But yeah, pretty much nobody uses DI. It's all image creation 
for various reasons, and often cross-image creation, which adds a new little set of wrinkles and things to go wrong. My suggestion for for the cleanup things is basically just a .d directory with scripts where packages can drop their their files into, and it, then whatever the image building process looks like, they just do run pods on that. Uh, I kind of propose that uh, for anything that can be done without having to write shell scripts, we could, we should. So um, we should. A, lo a lot of these are just you need to remove a file and it will be recreated on the next boot by like an init script or some or a system unit. Uh, and uh, uh, if we can, all, all we would probably need to do would be to add a new. Uh, Control header to the binary package that says that's just like the conf files fields, but instead instead says you know files to remove at first boot. Think of a name for it, and we would, we would only need to agree on that. There would be a couple of other things where you do need to do something a bit more complicated. Uh, I think that lib pepper I think needs to be deeply reconfigured uh, because it includes. Uh, uh, it's, it sets itself up with locale dependent information, that sort of thing. Uh, there's a couple of other things like that, but uh, but mostly we could deal with it just by removing files, and I think we could make that declarative. And in fact, we discovered from messing about with this that a lot of packages deal quite well with having some of their config taken away, and they usually do the right thing and put in a sensible default. Um, did quite a lot. Yeah, m most of the low-level stuff actually does a sensible job. Isn't it more to do with the problem that a post ins conflates things which should be done on the image and things that should be done on the instance, yes. and that what you actually want is two scripts? Yeah. So, I mean, like a generating SSH key, you only want to do it if you're actually booting a machine that becomes an instance or... An SSH key is a particularly interesting problem. There is a paper that somebody, that some security folks put together a while back, uh, which surveyed the internet for insecure uh, host keys, and it turned out that most of those were due to <coughs> were due to people who had naively separated out this image and instance thing for SSH host keys, and then they ended up generating a host key in an environment where, where by definition, they had no entropy. Uh, so it's a really bad idea to generate host key on first boot. Don't do it. Uh, put, do it in an environment where you where you actually have entropy instead. Isn't the trivial workaround for that to basically delay the SSH starting until you actually have a bit of entropy? Except on anything where you actually need SSH, you probably need it really early. I mean, cloud instances say you need it. You need it right from the start. Um, just in order, in order to provision the cloud instance, you need SSH. So, I mean, the the only other alternatives are things like installing HavageD or something along those lines. I mean, that that assumes that your per instance thing is on first boot. I didn't say that. Sure, sure. sure. So whatever is baking your instance sure. should do it and have lots of entropy, and then should push the button which runs the post post inst, which actually <laughs> sets up the SSH key, the machine ID, and reinstalls lib paper or whatever, right? So you you could have uh, a, an argument for post inst, which um, would allow you to do that crap later. Or, or we could put it into a trigger that doesn't get run if you're inside the bootstrap and you know the environment variable or whatever is set that stops. Um, so yeah, the, the instance setup could be deferred in a way that you can you can tell a post instance of a package needs to care, and we can probably write a list of them in the room. There are probably five of them or whatever um, that can say, okay. <laughs> But you know, a, a, a fairly small number of packages could could just opt into a, a mechanism where um, you say, "I'm making a system image. I'm not making an instance. Please don't do instance stuff, and let me know how to do it." And there could be a trigger or a way of reinvoking those post ins later to say, "Now I'm making an instance. Please do that." So, you know, Ubiquiti or whatever would would be just be able to poke those bits. I'll just add one more thing about SSH keys. Uh, 
in many cases, it's completely reasonable to try to generate an SSH key on a cloud VM or something, so long as you have proper, you could possibly have the hypervisor hand you high quality random number generators. There's some work on that, uh, but anyway. So uh, I did a bit of work on this sort of stuff on the wiki page, reproducible installs, um, a way to build an image or a file system um, twice and get the same thing. But um, the main thing I found, if I remember correctly, was the MANDB databases. That's a, sorry. Uh, that's a, that's a timestamp because, uh, sorry, that's a timestamp because MANDB needs to know when the database, or whether, uh, it needs to know the timestamp of the tree that it's comparing the database to so that it knows when to regenerate. So. Could you look at the, use the timestamp of the latest um, file? Like the latest, like the latest timestamp uh, of all the manual purges? It's, m you really, really do not want to LSTAT all of user share man. It's, <laughs> um, it's not quick. Uh, I think if I if I sped up MandyB some more in other ways, then maybe it might be justifiable. At the moment, it's a really important performance optimization. People get very upset if I break it. So um, there might be some tricks like, uh, actually, probably a sensible thing would be to touch the, instead of putting the timestamp in the file, touch the, uh, the database to the right, to have the right timestamp itself. And that's probably the fix for that. That sounds better. I was just doing diff, but I, um, if you did the timestamp on the file, that would change the images also. Right. That that could predate me, and I haven't thought about it very much. Uh, now that you've yeah. raised it as a problem, please file that as a bug so that I don't forget about it. Okay. Uh, and I can certainly work on moving the M time out of the DB. So related to the declarative config for files to remove at first boot where you want to get rid of like MD admin stuff or similar and also to reproducible installs, um, is anyone solving the problem with the um, host name of the host where you are running the CH root leaking into the actual system you're building? Because there are plenty of maintainer scripts relying on host name information for setting up configuration files which are quite painful to locate, especially if you're not at any time um, logging what's going on. I guess you could do two installs with different host names before and afterwards and then compare them. But uh, I, I've only, the reproducible installs thing was, was only to bootstrap. I haven't got any further than that. Yeah. But so uh, it would be quite handy to have something like uh, host name, namespace um, available from the outside to set for the CH root to just fake the host name for a reproducible build no matter where you're building? There is a tool with uh, Linux's namespacing feature. There's a thing called the UTS namespace and you could just use that and you can set the host name in the root where you're doing the build. Uh, it should actually be fairly straightforward to do this with nothing more complicated than the unshare utility, uh, unshare dash dash UTS, and then run hostname inside that. So if you're running into that problem, that's probably easily solvable. Uh, it's probably worth, I'm curious what image building utility you're using, because it's probably worth your image building utility growing this feature natively. So we basically have our own tool, Grimmel Life, based on five year install, and I mean we can control it anyway, but I'm just wondering if anyone has already a working solution like we we do this already. So But yeah, thanks for the for the hint. In general, would it be helpful to have packages not actually copying the hostname into their configuration? Um, should we, as, as a Debian project, strive for that? Should we encourage people to not do that? I see various mail servers copying the hostname, and people tend to forget to change that after some point. 
there was some discussion in uh, Josh's system D talk about NSS my host name solving this and storing the host name in one point. Uh, there was one, and also speaking of system D, there was talk of system D having its what's called first boot or first run configuration, uh, where it tries to boot up with an empty etc and the configuration, like just the minimal configuration needed for that one system. Uh, which actually reminds me, have people been playing with system D in derivatives and just going full ahead with the assumption that the only thing you care about is system D? Uh, I know that Tangaloo has been playing with this. I don't know if anyone else has been experimenting with that. We're basically out of time just for... Okay. Um, we've uh, we started doing in new things that Ubuntu is doing. We've started to assume that there's uh, there's no point in inflicting a migration on people for new stuff. We'll just go straight with system D. We have system D in our repos, and we've informed all our consumers that they can pull it and start playing with it. Uh, but the default is still old style. Colin, has Ubuntu finished that migration to system D? Uh, do you want to say something? Oh. The, the only thing that refrains us from migrating to system D and our easy tails image is the way it handles KXEC, which is not really compatible with KXEC tools right now. Well, we can discuss this later. Paul asked me to comment on uh, Ubuntu's migration to System D. It's this. I don't know if this is the place, but uh, we're we're working on it. It's it's part way through. We aim to be done is somewhere in this kind of a meta LTS cycle. Uh, so by six twenty four, hopefully well before that. But I'm not one of the people really working on it, so so I can't give you exact details. Okay. So thanks everyone for coming. I guess we'll close here.